The search for efficiency uh, in the Pentagon reminds me a little of the search for booze in the movie The Untouchables, where, uh, you know, there's this scene where Malone, which is Sean Connery's character, and Elliot Ness, which is Kevin Costner, are, are about to conduct their, what turns out to be their first successful liquor raid, and they're standing in Chicago, in downtown Chicago, across the street from a police station. And uh, right before they go in, uh, Ness looks at Malone, and he says, what, here? And, uh, and Malone says, Mr. Ness, everybody knows where the booze is. The problem isn't finding it. The problem is who wants to cross Capone. And, and so to me, the problem with saving money or finding efficiencies in DOD uh, is not finding things to cut, but finding a way to overcome the political opposition to doing so. Everyone that studies defense uh, knows that we've got more shipyards in the United States than we need, uh, given the size of the Navy. So we're carrying excess overhead in every procurement uh, every acquisition decision on a ship in the Navy. Uh, but doing something about that's hard because of the political uh, forces that all those jobs in those states create. The biggest employer in Maine is, is Bath Ironworks. Um, everybody knows that we could save money on defense by reforming commissaries on bases or by uh, using premiums and co-pays on TRICARE to control costs. But those are very popular uh, programs uh, in the services. Uh, so it, it takes a political fight. The, the costs of the programs are diffuse. Uh, they uh, come out in higher taxes or, or deficits, and the benefits are concentrated. So it's, it's hard to find someone who, who wants to take on the fight uh, and even harder to win it. Um, and uh, uh, one virtue of uh, economic downturns is that it lessens this problem, that it, that it concentrates the costs of spending. Uh, for, for both people and government, wealth limits choice. And austerity is, is uh, a good auditor, maybe the best auditor. A person uh, that loses income uh, and has to cut spending all of a sudden has to make some more choices about their money. They uh, have to ask themselves what they want the most and uh, which costs are excessive. And in government, uh, the prospect of reduced spending or even slowed spending uh, threatens political truces that luxury bought. Priorities compete more. Uh, and making ideolo ideology more important and, and sharpening debate. I mean, we're all here today because of, because of uh, deficits. And the, the arguments that I'm about to make about defense strategy are neither new nor inappropriate in times of surplus and booms, uh, but the sympathetic audience has grown uh, because of the deficit and fears about what it's going to cause in other spending programs. And the, the same effect holds within DOD, which is why the second uh, way to cut uh, defense spending the Nike way is not uh, as, uh, as dumb as it initially appears. The reduced budgets will cause heightened competition for resources uh, within the services and encourage them to find efficiencies to, uh, and protect their favored missions. I mean, um, I would think that maybe if, if there's more pressure on the re Marine Corps' budget, they might themselves go after at some point the, the V-22 because the problem with that is that, uh, yeah, it, it has longer range uh, than uh, all the helicopters the Marines has, but it, the trouble is that those other helicopters that have less range need to carry a lot of the supplies that the V-22 can't because it doesn't have the lift. So the real range of the V-22 is the range of the, su the support helicopters that are going to be bringing uh, all the artillery and other things that Marines flying in the V-22 need. So I think maybe you put some pressure on the Marines, they might make some decisions to get rid of the things that are uh, more easily sacrificed. And it's probably wishful thinking to think they'll go after V-22, but there might be some other inefficiencies uh, that, they, that they might go after. The problem with this method of, of cutting defense is, is uh, that it risks leaving you with a smaller military doing the same job, uh, which is unfair to the force and bad for the country. And, uh, and the, the defense portion of the uh, Bull Simpson deficit reduction plan uh, is bold, and I think it's politically helpful, uh, but I think it relies too much on these methods of cutting defense spending. By my count, almost 50 percent of the cuts they have in there are uh, purported efficiency gains, uh, and I don't think that's, that's uh, very realistic. And there's about one sentence in their PowerPoint presentation, one bullet point that says anything at all about uh, changing strategy or reducing commitment. So I think that's bad policy and politics because the, the cuts are somewhat imaginary and yet they can still get zinged for overburdening the force. So what we advocate is, is the third uh, or strategic path to cuts where you start with more modest goals, what we call restraint. And uh, I think we suffer in the United States today from a kind of strategic incontinence where we pile on 
uh, objectives uh, and responsibilities on the military without uh, much thought about whether or not they're good objectives. And that's a product of luxury, uh, which lets us evade choice. And the, the recent quadrennial defense review uh, is an example. It's more a list of objectives and hopes than a method of choosing among them. Uh, so restraint means husbanding American power and wealth rather than dissipating it by uh, spreading promises and forces willy-nilly and drawing us into conflicts that we could avoid. And, and there are four sort of guiding insights in this which are in our paper. Um, the first is that we don't need to defend Europe from nothing and Japan, South Korea, and others from dangers they can afford to meet themselves. Uh, we committed to defend these nations when they were weaker than enemies that we thought threatened us. Uh, and now things have changed. The New Deal is that we agree to defend them and they agree to let us. Um, and uh, I think that, that causes two problems, free riding and moral hazard. Um, by paying for their defense, uh, we're effectively subsidizing uh, their generous social welfare programs, uh, which uh, to me means that most Republicans who are, of course, for these commitments are today more interested in providing entitlements to Europeans than to Americans. Um, and I, I don't blame our, our allies for this, just as I don't blame most of you for uh, eating the free lunch that the Cato Institute's <laughs> about to provide you. It's our fault. <laughs> um, and some of our allies also engage in, in reckless behavior. This is moral hazard, under the assumption that we'll bail them out when they cause trouble. And I think you see this uh, in Japan, with these people going to this war shrine all the time and enraging, uh, enraging the Chinese. I think you see it in Taiwan. You see it in Israel. And uh, I think you even see it in places like Georgia, which we have not been foolish enough to formally agree to defend, uh, but they thought maybe they had some sort of guarantee. So we're providing disincentives in some ways for accommodation among neighboring states. So I say, and I also would add that letting our allies be their own first line of defense is not akin to renouncing them or saying that we don't care about them or like them or abandoning geopolitics. It, it, the, our allies, if we, our European allies would huff and puff if we said we're leaving NATO, but after that they'd get along just fine with the United States uh, if we were more distant because they've got all sorts of good reasons to do so. The second insight that, that drives our, our paper and our analysis here is, is that occupying and trying to fix failed states with ground forces is not a good counterterrorism method. And we've recently learned the hard way uh, that we have the power to occupy weak states at great cost and blood and treasure, but not uh, the power to fix them by organizing their politics. And also that people tend to dislike having their country occupied, and that might even be a cause of terrorism. So uh, th if that sounds glib, I, I encourage you to read the paper that Chris and I wrote on this called uh, Learning the Right Lessons from Iraq, which gives more detail. Now, the, the third insider point here is that um, it is hubristic to say, as our friends at Heritage and AEI who wouldn't come over here are now so fond of doing, uh, that we alone, the United States, can provide international stability. That, that notion both uh, overestimates our ability to referee most of the world and underestimates other states' desire to, to police their own regions or their ability to police their own regions if we don't. And the final point that, that guides our uh, strategy is, is that the, the dirty secret of, of American defense politics is that we're pretty safe here in the United States, uh, even with a small defense budget because of, because of our wealth, because of our geography, and because of nukes. Um, and uh, much of what we do abroad only matters to our security on the margins. Our, our Iran and North Korea are uh, awful regimes, and uh, they're troublemakers, but they're far off ones without the capacity uh, or will, I think, to attack us. Uh, Russia now uh, has an economy the size of Portugal and Italy combined, and an aging population, and a rusty conventional force that I think would have trouble getting into the Ukraine uh, successfully, let alone reclaiming their Soviet empire. China is, of course, growing its military, uh, but even under the plan Chris and I recommend, uh, would still be uh, far behind us and see an air capability. And we'd still be spending uh, about more than half of the Chinese military budget on research and development alone under our plan. Um, and of course, the way to hedge against uh, China's rise is, is not to arm more heavily today, but stay rich uh, so that we can arm uh, down the road if we have to. Finally, the, the constellation of jihadists that we f refer to as al-Qaeda are certainly a problem, uh, but they're best dealt with by policing and intelligence cooperation, and if need be, uh, niche and, and relatively cheap military capabilities like surveillance assets, drones, and special operations forces, not armies and navies. Mm -hmm.